This is the voice of the Report of the Week, signing on. Well, hello, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone listening in to today's special paranormal broadcast of VORW Radio International. Yeah, I'm feeling a bit better today, and good enough to at least, I would say, put put together a hopefully decent show. Uh, I say hopefully, I can't make any guarantees, but what I can guarantee is that we have a lot of really good stories for you, a lot of really good experiences, a wonderful audience, and I will certainly do my best to, uh, you know, moderate this show, so to speak, and uh, share as much as I can. Today we're going to be, uh, like I just said, pretty much sharing some paranormal experiences, ghost stories, uh, pieces of local lore, uh, even cryptids uh, are going to be thrown in the mix too, just paranormal Various oddities, you name it. It's just going to be a fun show. Uh, Why not? I know it's not Halloween, but you could do a show like this any day you want to. No harm there. The fan art for today's broadcast is credited to Sasuke. And I thought it suits the the mood of this program. Hopefully, uh, hopefully well. Now, on one other note, before we just get right into it, I know a lot of submissions came in. And we might not be able to get to everything today. Because after this surgery, my mouth, my speaking ability, it is getting better by the day. I'll probably do another show mostly dedicated to correspondence in uh, maybe a week or two. So we'll just get to everything else then. Because there's just so much good stuff. I always feel bad if I leave something out, but there will be more opportunities. Uh, Mark my words there. So just stay tuned. Uh, If your response isn't included in the show today... Just tune in for the next one, and we'll probably have a special paranormal segment uh, for that one as well. On one final note, uh, if you're listening in, you could always correspond with the broadcast to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. And I always hate bringing this up. I mean, I really don't like it, uh, but I will just do it quick, and this is the one time in this show you'll ever hear it, and then that's it. Understand that this broadcast is listener-supported. Producing this show and getting it syndicated out on a number of radio stations isn't cheap, but if you enjoy this broadcast, you want to hear more of it, and you want to keep it going, just listen in. And if you like what you heard, consider supporting the program with a donation via PayPal to v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com or via Patreon at patreon.com slash the report of the week. Please consider it if you enjoy what you hear. And with that, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This is VORW Radio International, the special paranormal edition. So without further ado, let's get into our first paranormal experience. My name is Stephen, and I have a paranormal experience I would like to share. I work for a guy on his property, And occasionally, I stay there and look after things while he and his family go away on trips. This place is an estate that has a southern-style mansion that sits up on a large hill. To give you an idea of what it looks like inside, there's very old-looking furniture, tall ceilings, giant paintings and curtains, and a couple of marble head busts. It basically looks like Disneyland's haunted mansion inside. I've stayed there a few times before, but I've never had any weird things happen. But the instance that I'm wanting to talk about happened on the last night of my most recent stay. It was around 10pm and I was sitting on a chair in the guest room talking to my friend on the phone. I started to notice a noise above me, told my friend to hold on a second. It sounded like there was someone in the room, right above me, pressing their foot on and off the floor, making it creak. Went on for maybe 15 to 20 seconds, with around 3 seconds in between each creak. Now I'm used to hearing the usual sounds of a house settling, but this sounded completely different. I told my friend what I just heard, and he said well maybe it could be from the window that was beaming heat on the floor earlier, and it was just cooling down. That's what I like to tell myself, but I don't have any way of knowing for sure. 
I joked to my friend that the noise came from the doll that sits on the bed in that room above me and it was walking around. Well, that joke backfired when I later hung up the phone and had to go to bed. It was a weird feeling to think that there was a possibility of someone else being there, ghost or human, when I'm supposed to be completely alone. That was my paranormal experience from Stephen in Southern California. Thank you, Stephen, for your paranormal experience. Unusual sounds. You know, that is uh, a very common sort of paranormal encounter uh, that I think a lot of us, I won't say all of us, but a lot of us have at least heard. And uh, whether we attribute it to the paranormal or not, right, that really comes down to the individual Um, But I certainly, I know that there have been instances myself where I've heard strange noises. And I'll think for a minute, well, what is that? You know, I don't normally, I don't normally hear that. And a lot of the time it does come down to something uh, that can be proven. You know, it comes down to, it could even be a rodent or something making noises. But there definitely are those occasions where you hear something and no matter what you do, you can't pinpoint what exactly the source of this noise was. I think especially given the location that you you, uh, were in when you heard this, obviously an old mansion with, uh, I'm sure, a lot of history to it. Kathy writes in next, My experience with the paranormal comes from an urban legend derived from my state's history. I'm a North Dakota native. Growing up, I would often hear what sounded like a woman's screams, especially during blizzards. Now, according to my family, this is because back in 1888, there was a blizzard that swept through the prairie. The snow and wind were so thick it damned anyone who was left out in it. This was the fate for many school children who attempted to make it home with no avail. And the absence of these young ones caused many mothers to run out into the storm in hopes of saving their children, which too would be a fatal mistake. It is said that these mothers still wander the frozen prairie in the dead of winter, calling into the wind for the ones who never made it home. That was from Kathy. Thank you for sharing a little bit of an urban legend there, some local lore in terms of obviously the winter weather uh, that I know some of us have already been dealing with this year. It's already been a little bit of a cold one, at least in some parts of the country. Uh, It is interesting when you think about it, obviously, uh, regardless even if it's just stories or not, of course, given these storms, whatever they might be, be that blizzards or hurricanes or severe weather, tornadoes, whatever, uh, many people have obviously lost their lives, uh, you know, in these severe weather events. I would say either way, again, going down to creepy sounds... You know, it is creepy when, I'm sure, in the middle of the night you hear those sounds and you think back to those local legends. Uh, I know it would certainly be a creepy thing. Thanks for writing in. Jamie is checking in next, uh, writing in from Ireland. I live in Ireland, and I gotta say, Halloween is one of those holidays where you either get into the spirit and try to treat it for what it is, or you just let it subside and prepare yourself for the Christmas holidays. I remember Halloween was treated as a very festive time in primary school, but as you get older, it seems uh, more targeted toward children in terms of trying to be scary, uh, dressing up and eating junk food, I suppose. I like to spend the holiday watching creepy YouTube videos, especially the ones that are uploaded around Halloween, and I also enjoy watching horror movies and playing scary video games. Now, I know a lot of classical Halloween tales, uh, such as Jack-O-Lantern and the legendary Banshee, come from Ireland, as many people see the country as the birthplace of Halloween. No, I've never heard a Banshee scream in the night, unless it's someone walking home from the pub on a Saturday evening. I have to admit, the stories surrounding paganism, the Hellfire Club in Dublin, and Leap Castle, definitely gave me an open mind into the paranormal. I've never been to any of these places, but I have visited a rundown mansion in New Ross County, Wexford, called Loftus Hall. I'd really appreciate if you would include this place or any other locations in the Halloween show. Loftus Hall was believed to have been visited by the devil. A woman called Anne Tottenham 
had her baby killed and bricked up within the walls as it was believed to be the child of Satan, while she slowly went mad over the rest of her life and was imprisoned inside a tapestry room until her death. There's also a hold in the roof where it's believed the devil made his exit after the residents realized he had a hooves on his feet when one of them bent down to retrieve a card under the table as they were playing a game of cards. It is advertised as the most haunted house in Ireland. I enjoy your work. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Jamie, over there in Ireland for sharing a little bit of, again, local lore of a, uh, you know, obviously a haunted uh, location over there. I have to tell you, you know, whenever I think of these these locations and sometimes the story that surrounds them, just how gruesome some of this stuff is, you know? It certainly is. Thank you for writing in, Jamie. Next up, we have Matthew writing in. Listener since 2017, checking in for the first time, uh, writing in from Pennsylvania. About 10 years ago, I was staying at my relative's vacation home in Nantucket, Massachusetts. The house must have been built in the 1800s, around when whaling was still a thing. Anyway, I stayed at this house over three nights. Nothing happened the first night, but on the second night, after I woke up around 2 to 2.30 a.m., someone was calling my name over and over again. Matthew. Matthew. This lasted for what felt like ten minutes. After that, I walked around the upstairs, and all I heard was the normal creaking of the house. On the third and final night, I was there. Nothing unusual happened, but I didn't get much sleep. To this day, I've never been back there. To this day, I still try to convince myself that it was just a dream, but I was wide awake. It was definitely not a sleep paralysis dream or anything like that. Best regards from Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Sometimes I think... Because you get all sorts of different experiences. Obviously, uh, you, will, you will sometimes get the experiences that are very hardcore. Uh, where, let's say, someone sees an object being moved. Uh, they may see what they perceive to be an apparition or some sort of figure or some sort of entity, for lack of a better word. Uh, obviously, those can be downright creepy, but sometimes I think even... Some of the smaller ones, when you really when you really begin to understand the context of the situation, uh, can be just as unnerving. Something as simple as that. You keep hearing your name over and over being repeated. Uh, you know, obviously you don't know where it's coming from or what it is. It, you know, is it your mind? Is it not? What's going on? Uh, given the duration that you said that it lasted for, it would certainly raise a good amount of questions. You know, 10 minutes, that's a long time, I will tell you that. And again, what's interesting to me, uh, with a lot of experiences, is I think a commonality that you are already seeing established in just a few of the uh, experiences we're reading already. So many of the locations where you have these events that occur are all older. They're all older houses, let's say, older mansions uh, that... Now, there's many explanations as to why that can be, and it depends on what your own stance is. Some people may just say, well, it's because it's an older building that has that potential to just be noisier, right? Other people will say it's because these older structures have more energy to them. Many more people may have lived there. Many more things could have happened in these structures, good or bad, right? Uh, so there's many different explanations, or at least theories, as to why a lot of these places are all older where it happens. Very interesting. Thank you for writing in. We now have Damien writing in with a submission, saying, This is my first time writing in, but I feel that your Halloween show would be the perfect opportunity to share with you a very strange occurrence that my wife and I experienced in our early 20s, but also it is something I have experienced since childhood. I guess I'll start all the way back when this all began. When I was a child, and all the way up to adulthood, I would have times where I would wake up in the early hours of the morning, frozen, unable to move or talk, 
and having an intense fear rush over me, as I could sense a presence in the room with me, but I could never see anything, and would eventually find myself falling asleep against my will. As a child, I had no idea what was going on. My mother told me I was having night terrors. In my early teens, I spoke to my mother again about it, but this time I could explain it much better and in detail, and she told me she had the same experiences as a child, being unable to move or call out for help, but she said she would see shadow people in the room with her. I kept having these experiences even as an adult. I always kept it to myself and never shared it with my wife, but one night changed that, and it is something my wife and I will talk about from time to time, even to this day, as it is something we can't explain. My wife and I were both 22 at the time. We both had dinner. We put our four-year-old daughter to bed. There was a full moon that night, so I had the curtains open to let the moonlight into our room before heading to bed ourselves. I suddenly woke up, unable to move, unable to talk, heart beating out of my chest, filled with intense fear and feeling a presence in the room. The usual symptoms. But this time something was different. This time, and for the first time, I could see something in my peripheral vision standing in the doorway to our room. It was a dark figure, but it had a smoke-like appearance to it. I tried screaming to my wife, but nothing came out. I tried moving, but I couldn't. I was just laying there, staring at this thing in the corner of my eye for a minute or two. Then I had this overwhelming sensation of danger. I was scared for my wife and daughter, and I formed the willpower to actually start moving. I slowly started raising my upper body off the bed, which caused me pain due to the strain, but then the figure started moving toward me, and I could see its eyes, the darkest eyes I've ever seen, and then I passed out. I woke up to daylight, and in a panic quickly looked around the room, but I was in there by myself. I walked out to my wife and daughter, and my wife made me coffee. As usual, I said nothing to my wife about it, until she told me that she had a nightmare last night. She couldn't move or speak, and she had seen something standing at the end of our bed, and that was all she could remember. This shocked me. I explained everything to her that morning. She said she had never experienced anything like it before. Naturally, we used the internet to search for answers, but all we could find were articles on sleep paralysis. If it was something I had experienced by myself, I would have accepted sleep paralysis as the outcome. But as it was something we both experienced on the same night, I just can't accept it. What are the chances of two people in the same room, on the same night, having sleep paralysis and seeing the same thing? I'm 35 now and have not experienced it again since that night, and neither has my wife. I've even asked my daughter if she has had anything similar happen to her, and she hasn't. But a disturbing thing is that when my son, Mason, was seven, he told me he had nights where he wakes up and can't move or talk, and there is something in his room. He's 14 now, and it has stopped and I truly hope it has for all of us. This is my experience I wanted to share with you. Hope you're doing well. Much love from Australia, from Damien. Thank you, Damien, for your experience. This was absolutely fascinating, because I started reading this, and the first thing I thought to myself, as I was even just making my way uh, through the first paragraph, was, this is creepy, but... It's sleep paralysis, right? That's what it sounded like to me. Now, I suppose I'm fortunate enough to have never uh, experienced sleep paralysis, you know, in that form. Of course, when I was young, I remember I've had night terrors uh, as a young child, but I've never had, 
you know, the full-blown sleep paralysis, which obviously I don't necessarily want to call it formulaic, but the experiences, you know, from one individual to the next uh, always do have those similarities where you can't really move, you have a lot of the time this dreadful anxiety, this fear, and of course that accompaniment uh, of a shadowy figure is oftentimes there, or at least some sort of creature, or whatever you want to call it. Now, as you were continuing, what got me is the fact that your wife experienced the same thing at the same place on the same night. This is one of those experiences, I think, where does one want to attribute it to coincidence? Obviously, is it possible for it to be a coincidence? Yes. But then you start examining the odds. Boy, that would certainly be a rare one, wouldn't it? For not only you to experience this, but for someone else who has probably never gone through that, to experience it at the exact same night, the exact same place, and almost the exact same situation that you did. What are the odds of that? Very low, I would wager. So that's one that really, at least to me, it makes you think. It makes you think, well, is it the sleep paralysis? Is it just that? Is it just an extreme coincidence? Is there something that maybe there's more to it that we just do not understand right now? Or is it something else entirely? Very interesting. It was great to hear from you, Damien. Thank you for sharing that experience. David writes in, listening from Utah. I recently had an experience with a ghost or entity. A few days ago, I was woken by a person or presence pushing up against me in my bed. I just assumed that it was my wife trying to get close, so I opened my eyes and leaned in, and I couldn't see her or anyone there. Suddenly, the ghost or entity pushed through me. I was startled and anxious to figure out what it was. It felt more real than anything I've felt before. I told my wife what happened, and she assures me it was a dream, but I'm still unclear because it felt so real. I'm still trying to figure out, but I can't decide if it was a vivid dream or something actually passed through me. Thank you, David, uh, checking in from Utah. You know, it's interesting, your choice of words there. You know, you you wake up, at least, and again, you can't... You still don't... Because it's... What I'm trying to say is that it's such a unique experience. Obviously, that's never happened to you before. You're trying to figure out, okay, was this just the product of an extremely realistic, vivid uh, dream? Or did something strange actually happen here? Right, because given the timing of things, you were there in bed, you were just waking up. But what you felt was obviously a sensation which, at least to you, you know what you felt, right? Someone can say, you didn't feel that. Of course you did, right? You know what you felt, this very strange sensation. The question is, where did it happen? Was it essentially in your mind, in the dream world, or was it in the present? I know for me, one... uh, interesting thing that happened a couple weeks ago that I talked about in a previous broadcast was when I was in bed and I was just, I was asleep and I woke up to this feeling. It wasn't in my heart, but it was close to it of just this absolutely insane force that it almost felt like for some reason, almost like my soul, my being, was being sucked out of my body. I know to some that would sound like an absolutely preposterous thing to say, and I was really shaken up. I had no idea what was happening. It it literally felt like there was this exterior force that either hit me at such an immense speed or what, like I physically jerked. But it, it was more than that. It felt like not only was my own body pushed, but whatever it is that makes me me, was almost forced out of my body. And it wasn't, but boy, it felt like it came close. And like I was saying, it feels like such a preposterous thing for me to say. I know 
if I could have gone back in time a few years and listened to me saying this right now, I would have dismissed it. I would have thought, what an absurd thing that is. You know, but I know what I felt. And I researched all the different phenomenons and the so-called hypnic jerk. And it wasn't that. I've gone through that too. And it was not that. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was just some sort of very intense spasm, but it was unlike anything I felt before. And I know for a fact that it was real. You know, I knew, I, I know that what I felt wasn't just some sort of product of my imagination. So I understand where you're coming from, David, I really do. You felt what you felt, but why? What was the reason? I don't know why I felt what I felt. The best answer I have in my own case is there is no reason. It just happened just because. So thank you for sharing that, David. You're listening to VORW Radio International. Coming up next, let's go to a piece of audio feedback. Hi, John. My name is Tom, and thank you for taking my message here and giving your thoughts, your views on it. So. I thought the, your coming Halloween episode, this would be something that you would like to hear, which uh, is also something that I finally wish to share for other people. So what wouldn't be better on your podcast, uh, which I also enjoy to a large extent. Um, so this is going to be it's a personal experience. First to mention, I would not really consider this creepy uh, in the traditional Halloween spooky kind of way, you know. It's rather an experience which seems very kind, uh, gentle, and has several questionable elements to it. It certainly has a supernatural dimension to it, which is the reason why it for some reason has become so personal to me and I always held it very close to me and I just don't share it with just about anyone. And everything just know, just inform you that that I know about this situation is all from my mom who shared this story much or this experience later on. Every now and then she might bring it up and she still don't have a clear, reasonable understanding for what actually took place. The situation goes back quite a while in time. I would estimate it to be somewhere around 1992 and 93 which makes it hard for me to even remember anything because uh, I was born in the 1990. It could even have been much later this experience, but just let's say that I was small. I was not a complete toddler, but close. I, as I said, I had no memory, but I learned to climb and I learned to walk. And yes, climb, and, and we will get to that. So remember climbing. In one of the rooms of my parents' house where I grew up, which I was believe, I believe it was my brother's room. And in there we had a two-story cabinet against the wall to the left when you enter that squared shaped room. Uh, the ground level part of the cabinet had, had about two, three to four drawers and could, you know, you pull out and put clothes in them while the second story or top story cabinet had two glass doors you opened one to the left and one to the right as what i remember from later years there were always so many interesting things in there in that top story cabinet with the glass doors i don't remember in detail what it was in there but it was cluttered with patches video vhs old coins, old notes from different parts of the world, among other things, for example. Uh, for what I've been told later on was that I had pulled out one or two drawers on the first story cabinet and made my way up to the second story cabinet to investigate and discover what was there. And the only problem was that uh, while I did my climbing there, <laughs> things would take south pretty soon. Uh, the day of this experience, my mom, she heard a great jangling noise from that 
the bedroom where I was in. And she ran in there from the other room she was in to see what, what the heck was happening there. And what she would see just didn't make any sense whatsoever from here. So imagine she entered the room and saw me facing the first story cabinet with the drawers pulled out that I did pull out to be able to climb there to reach the second story. And she saw the second story cabinet behind my back, behind me and behind my back, intact with the glass doors both wide open. I do not know if the doors were facing my back or on the other side of the room. However, as I understand this, the second story cabinet had been lifted over me 180 degrees while me falling on my bum to be safely placed away from me behind my back. All this due to my weight from stepping on the drawers causing the second story cabinet falling over me though it did not fall down on me but to be placed far behind me my mom my mom just uh, didn't understand how this whole situation and cabinet could be away from me and facing my back since the normal thing would be yeah i'm stepping on the drawers the cab top cabinet falling directly onto me which should have gotten me severely injured if not dead from this so yeah that was my experience which i don't really recall myself actually <laughs> anyway i i thought this had to be shared now and even if it's quite a personal thing for me i do not know for sure how this whole thing has really affected me other than i do feel some presence about being protected it's not really it's something that i'm very humbled about it's not something that I take for granted and it's not something that i think too much about or really talk with anyone about and there has been times when i treated myself really stupid and behaved reckless things could have been worse than the outcome actually um, but i guess that's also a thing when you're younger you believe in that you are superhuman <laughs> and immortal you know so anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this and hope to get your comments on this, John. It would be interesting to hear your view. Well, thank you for sharing your experience uh, about the cabinet there. Certainly, I think it would definitely, it would come down to uh, probably an unexplained event in that circumstance. I think you did a very good job explaining it. Where as I was visualizing it, you have this cabinet, you were trying to... Obviously, you know, you were young, you were trying to go up it, you didn't realize the physics of it at the time, that you put this weight here and that it may fall back on you. And instead, you know, as you were going up it, of course it did fall, but somehow it fell in a way that defied at least reasonable explanation, at least as, as you guys see it. It should have fallen on you, but it didn't. How did it land and end up the way that it did, right? And that's just one of those, because, you know, obviously you were there, but you were very young. You don't remember the event, uh, but those that did witness it, at least after the fact, just can't get their heads around how it did exactly what it did. <laughs> what I have to say to that is, look, no matter what the explanation for that is, I think the way that it turned out is probably the best way it could have, Right. No matter how it landed, the way that it did, most importantly, you made it out pretty much unharmed, and it could have been a whole lot worse. So for that, you know, it might have been strange, but at least there is a little bit of a happy ending, so to speak. Thanks for checking in. Next up, we have an email coming in from Nathan in Portland, Oregon. I know it's probably too late to make it onto the broadcast to interject. No, it's not. No worries there. Oh, look, I was late getting this show up, so late submissions, uh, I was able to squeeze a bunch in. No worries. Continuing. I would like to share this with you and the audience, if it's still possible. This is my father's story about a Sasquatch encounter. It's a true story about when he was deer hunting before I was born in the mid to late 80s. 
I'm not sure what year, but he was married to his second wife, so probably the 85 to 88 period. We're from Portland, Oregon, and he was hunting deer on the Oregon coast, in the coast range mountains at dusk. Deer are usually active at dawn and dusk. He was up on the ridge line, above where all the trees that were below him had been clear cut. The trees that had been cut down in this area had been particularly old trees, so they left behind quite large diameter stumps. As he was scanning for deer, potentially walking through the clear cut, he spotted up on an adjoining ridge two figures, one standing on each side of one of these old-growth tree stumps. The sun was setting behind the ridge that they were on, so he couldn't really make out their features because they were silhouetted. However, he could see through his binoculars that they didn't have a rifle slung on their shoulders, so he didn't think they were hunters. What was unusual was that based on the size of the stump that they were standing next to, he says they would have had to have been the largest people he'd ever seen in his life. As he was watching them, he started to get an overwhelming feeling that they were watching him, and all the hair on the back of his neck and body stood up. After observing them for a few moments, each figure went off into the woods behind them, and at that point he decided that it would be a good time to hightail it back to the car. He was actually pretty shaken by the experience and, sw- and still swears by it. He always stresses how huge these people were, that they must have been at least seven feet or taller, and were just massive across the chest based on the relative size of the huge old-growth stumps. That was from Nathan in Portland, Oregon. Thank you for writing in, Nathan. I always love a good Sasquatch, uh, Bigfoot encounter. Some of those are my favorites. You know, recently, and I'll go through this phase every now and then, recently I am in the midst of another (laughs) Bigfoot phase, so to speak. And, uh, you know, whether these creatures... Regardless of their legitimacy, it is a subject that is beyond fascinating to me. As you know, many of the large primates in Africa weren't formally identified until the 1800s. Before then, they were merely a subject of mythology. Now, granted, a lot has changed since the 1800s. And I think one could reasonably argue that if there is a large primate in North America, it would have been discovered by now, but uh, some would say that it is the elusive nature of this creature, which is why it has yet to be discovered. Either way, I think just the thought, just a hypothetical thought, that there could be this large primate creature still in the most remote parts of the United States and Canada, just lurking around, living its life, Uh, you know, trying to hide and live in solitude from human sight is, uh, I don't know, it's, it's fascinating, it's enthralling, and it is creepy. For anyone out there who is interested, uh, in Sasquatch and Bigfoot and all of those sorts of cryptids, I discovered a YouTube channel that I would like to shout out right now, because I think that this individual... He does a really good job. Now, granted, this is for individuals who are um, pro-Bigfoot, or at least are interested in entertaining the thought uh, that this creature may exist. So bear that in mind. But I just think that this is one of the most detailed channels I have ever seen on the matter. Uh, I just really like the host. I like the way that he discusses things. I like his attention to detail, and he is... A darn good uh, storyteller, if if I had to say so myself. The name of this channel that I'd like to recommend if you're interested in Bigfoot, uh, it's called Bob Gimlin. That's Bob, B-O-B. The last name is Gimlin, G-Y-M-L-A-N. That's G-Y-M-L-A-N. Just look up Bob Gimlin. And, uh, you know, he uploads, eh, you know, fairly regularly, maybe a video or two every month. 
Um, but from what I've seen, just his attention to detail is amazing. And whether you're a believer or a skeptic, I hope you would find uh, such videos entertaining, to say the least, or perhaps even informative. But uh, it's a very interesting resource, and I'm very glad that I stumbled upon his channel. What I like is that, uh, granted, while he supports the existence of these creatures, he tries to look at each situation objectively and assesses various possibilities. He just doesn't jump to the conclusion right away that this has to be a Bigfoot. He looks at all other, uh, you know, circumstances as well, and, and he is well-versed in his, in his work, uh, that I will say likewise. So I'd recommend checking it out if this is a subject uh, of interest to you. Uh, one interesting thing that I was looking at was the Missing 411 series, which I had heard of a year or two ago, and I finally got the chance to listen. That isn't explicitly in terms of Bigfoot stuff, it's just it deals with disappearances in the national parks. And in that case, David Politis, the uh, author of The Missing 411, he, he leaves the door open. He just tries to draw certain parallels, but he never expli explicitly says what he thinks, the reason for any disappearances, if there is one, uh, what that might be. But it's a certainly, that's interesting too, if you want to go down that road, just a few resources I'd like to point in your direction. Of course, if you want to go ahead and, you know, read some encounters, one resource is the uh, BFRO, but, you know, some people don't really like them because they did a lot of shows on Animal Planet, and people say they're just sellouts and what have you. But uh, sometimes you can go to their website and you can, re you can read some of the, you know, Bigfoot reports from people around the country. I would personally recommend reading any Class A reports because those are the most direct sightings, but some of the Class B reports are interesting as well. Um, but there's just a, a trove of resources online that you could really immerse yourself in if, if Bigfoot is a subject that uh, you would like to spend some time uh, focusing on, if, if you would like to. Uh, I, the reason, again, why I'm railing all this stuff off right now, why I'm rattling all this stuff off, for a better word, uh, is because it's something that I've been spending a lot of time on lately, so uh, that's just what it comes down to. But yeah, to just get into your experience again real quick, um, one thing that I think is so common with so many reports of these cryptids is the immense size of these creatures. You know, it's always such a, a you know, a qualifying characteristic. Everyone says how massive they are. Very tall, very big, bipedal, and uh, usually, you know, very dark, very dark hair or fur. So it's really interesting. Uh, thank you for writing in. Let's go over to another piece of listener audio feedback. This one is from Lisa. Hi, I live in Seattle. And last Halloween, around 12 midnight, my boyfriend and I decided to go to a cemetery. And so we went to the cemetery and it was starting to rain and it was slightly windy. So we thought, oh, this would be perfect perfect night to go to the cemetery. Anyways, we're walking to the cemetery. It's very quiet. And all of a sudden, we saw something. We both stop and look up. And to our amazement, there is something or someone that is probably seven or eight feet tall with a long trench coat and a hat. And they are running through the cemetery, probably at least 20 miles per hour. We could not believe what we just seen. We just stood there and looked at each other. And let me tell you, we ran so fast out of that cemetery. You had to be there to actually believe it. And we might go back this Halloween 2020 to the same cemetery and see if we experience anything else. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience from Lisa in Seattle. What makes that one really interesting and and what really i know i don't always like the word the word credibility because when you kind of say that it almost undermines the individual account but it's always interesting to me when someone 
sees something strange, and there's a witness there as well that, you know, more than one person saw this. So it's not like, oh, you know, maybe you just saw something strange. No, the both of you guys were in this cemetery on this bad weather night, and you both see this figure, looks like wearing a hat, a coat, just <laughs> barreling through this, this uh, cemetery. And I mean, you both know what you saw was unusual. You know, you said you stop, you look at each other. It's like, did, did, did we really see what we just think we saw? <laughs> you know? So uh, that is interesting that the both of you saw that also, given the conditions, given the area. A very interesting experience. Thank you, Lisa, for taking the time to record that. You're listening to VORW Radio International. We have an anonymous listener writing in uh, who tunes in on Spotify for about a year. Anyway, this isn't really a paranormal experience, but I have experienced sleep paralysis sometime last year. I was dreaming, but I could tell that I was about to wake up. I couldn't move or breathe at all, but I did realize I was having sleep paralysis. And I remember that there could be demon-like figures at the edge of your bed when you experience paralysis, so I kept my eyes closed. It felt like someone was putting their hand over my mouth so I wouldn't breathe. And I tried screaming, but it was muffled. It didn't last long, but it was something that really traumatized me since then. A short experience, but thank you for writing in. You know, again, sleep paralysis, like we've been saying, it's just, it's it's really creepy. It's really creepy. Obviously, there's a lot of, of research that has been going into it lately, and lots of different explanations. You know, some have said uh, it could just be due to disrupted REM sleep. Uh, it could perhaps be due to sleep deprivation. Uh, some have gone as far as to say maybe it's a sign of underlying uh, psychiatric disturbances. But either way, it is a horrific occurrence, and they said as many as four out of ten people uh, could experience or have experienced sleep paralysis. Really, really terrifying stuff, especially as we're sleeping. A very, very vulnerable time for us, granted. And it, it's just scary. It's just very scary. Thank you for writing in. Next up, we have some feedback coming in from Joe. Take it away. Hi, Review Bra. This is Joe. Big fan of the show. In regards to the paranormal experiences topic, I've had a number of encounters with supernatural beings, and the most interesting of which was when I was at a social event in my friend's house about ten years ago. It was a lovely, sunny afternoon in the middle of summer, and a party guest had asked me to go upstairs to fetch her camera. So I went upstairs into a bedroom, found the camera, and as I was about to go back downstairs, I saw in regular bright indoor lighting a figure, a dark humanoid figure, walk from the top of the stairs, across the landing, and into the bathroom about ten feet in front of me. After spending about a minute and a half, standing very still, being very confused, I went downstairs and told everyone what I'd just seen, this uh, person made of darkness. We came to the conclusion that it was probably a hallucination, or a trick of the light, and we all continued with our lives. But a few days later, after everyone had gone home, uh, my friend who owned the house told me that about a year before his middle-aged co-worker had given him uh, some of his old vintage 70s and 80s clothes for my friend to sell on eBay. But before he could do so, the co-worker died quite suddenly. And from what I know about ghost lore and the uh, inclination for a spirit to return to Earth to tend to unfinished business, the three-dimensional shadow figure I saw may well have been my friend's dead co-worker. Now, me personally, I'm not much of a believer in this stuff. I'm just a witness of really strange things. But that's definitely the most traditional by-the-book ghost encounter I've had. And overall, it was quite an ordinary experience and not that terrifying in the slightest. Thank you for taking the time to uh, recite your experience. 
what I really like is that you went ahead and you explained, look, I'm, I might be a bit of a skeptic. I don't necessarily believe in the paranormal, or at least I'm not an enthusiastic believer, perhaps. I really don't want to put words in your mouth. But you saw what you saw, and this is just what you happened to bear witness to. It's interesting that you did mention, well, could it perhaps be maybe some of the energies that are in this clothing, right? What if it is? Uh, certainly, that's not the first time that that hypothesis has ever been has ever been offered. Uh, in a lot of cases, some people may say, well, perhaps a certain object, a certain item, a certain location. Perhaps it carries certain energies uh, of the deceased, which then carry on into other things, be that apparitions, or noises, or voices, or whatever it may end up uh, being. Very interesting. Thank you, Joe, for checking in. Going back over to Utah, we hear from Leiden in Utah. I work for a large metropolitan fire department as a firefighter paramedic. This took place on a snowy fall night at about 2 a.m. I was working on the ambulance on this shift. With eight years working in this field of work in a large city, I felt like I had seen just about anything that could be thrown my way. This night changed everything. We were dispatched to a park that is adjacent to a mountain. Several callers in nearby apartments called in, stating that they could hear a woman screaming for help somewhere in the park. In the back of the park, where it meets up with the mountain, there is a dense, dark, woodsy area. There are several fire pits and grills that are sprawled throughout the woods where people would have get-togethers and enjoy a campfire with friends and family. The location was a bit out of our jurisdiction that our station covered. Due to a large fire that was taking place in the city, units were sparse, and we were the closest unit. Typically, on any response, an ambulance and a fire engine would respond on all medical calls. However, due to the fire, we were the only unit dispatched to this call. En route to the call, additional details were stating that they could hear a very grisly, almost murderous scream for help coming from the woodsy area in the park. No other details were obtained on our way to the call. Once we arrived, we parked in the parking lot closest to the entrance area of the woodsy area. My partner and I determined that we would need to divide and conquer the large park. My partner would look near the soccer fields to the south of where we parked, and I would investigate the woods a bit to see if I could hear or see anything. The trail leading into the woodsy area is on a slight incline. Once I had crested the hill, I noticed that about a football field's distance into the woods, I noticed the glow of a campfire. I shouted to my partner that I was going to investigate the fire and see if anyone was in the area. He informed me that he would check his designated area and would meet back at the ambulance. On my radio strap, I had a small flashlight that illuminated my path into the woods fairly well. Keep in mind, this was a cold, slightly snowy fall night. My footsteps crunching in the snow and stepping on the leaves and twigs could easily be heard. I would also be able to hear someone coming as well. Once I got closer to the campfire area, I noticed six to seven people standing around the fire. I figured it was a bunch of drunk teens goofing off around the fire. As I rounded the corner to where the trail that broke off from the main one to the trail that headed in the direction of the campfire, I froze in my tracks. I was met with several hooded figures standing around the campfire. Only one of them reacted to my presence. The hooded figure closest to me just simply turned and said in a low, quiet voice, You need to leave. Now. That was all I needed to hear. I was far outnumbered by several people who very obviously had no good intentions in mind. I turned on my heels and very hastily ran back to where I came. Once I returned to the ambulance, 
I noticed an officer had arrived to assist us in figuring out what was going on. My partner obviously could tell I was in distress as I was out of breath, and more than likely had a look of pure horror on my face. I described what I had seen to my partner and the officer that had arrived. Both seemed shocked, and seemed like neither one of them knew what to say besides a unanimous, what the hell? We decided that with the power of numbers and the assistance of the police, we would go back and investigate. And as we walked back to the main trail, we noticed several sets of footprints that were coming back our way. The prints then turned directly into the dense woods where there was no trail. The three of us shined out lights into the dense thicket. Due to the intensity of trees and brush, we were unable to see extremely far into the woods. Once we had returned to the campfire, we found no one. Just a burning campfire and a single shoebox. We looked at the shoebox with anticipation on what on earth might be in this box. The officer removed the lid with his boot. We had anticipated that there would be nothing good to be found in this box, considering the circumstances, and we were all right. Sitting in the bottom of the box was what appeared to be a freshly decapitated rabbit head. We had all seen enough and were plenty creeped out. We determined that it was time to get the hell out of there. The ambulance ride back to the station was deathly silent. Neither of us knew what to say or what to make of what we saw. We just wanted to get back and try and forget about everything that took place. Two days later, a news story broke about several people's pets who had been brutally murdered in the area. I don't know if the incidents were connected at all, but from what I saw that night, my gut tells me yes. So thank you for writing in Leiden over there in Utah. That is a really, really interesting experience, to tell you the truth. Obviously, a lot of people want to interpret that encounter as they will. Uh, some will say it's merely coincidence. Others will say, what if it was some sort of, you know, sacrifice? Uh, others still might say, and that's very, very brazen to do, uh, obviously in the middle of the night like that and making so much noise, uh, bound to attract attention. I think taking your story into account and inferring that what happened happened, uh, there are obviously many witnesses in that case. Right, you had all of the individuals in the area who heard all this noise, who heard all this screaming, and all the numerous calls that came in regarding that. So number one, you have the folks there who heard something. They don't know what it was, but they heard something. You have yourself that obviously saw these individuals. And then you have your partner and the police who were there as well, who, while they didn't see the people you saw, saw the campfire, saw what looked like that maybe animal sacrifice, and of course the footprints leading into the woods. So something strange happened there, and what it would tell me is the fact that the folks that were there, as soon as you got there, and as soon as you know they told you that you need to leave, that you need to get out, and then it was the middle of the night, it was snowy, it sounds to me like there was some, again, like thick woods there, that they just left into the woods like that. Uh, it tells me that whatever they were up to, they weren't up to anything good to just take off like that. Or they didn't want to be seen, but in that instance, again, why would they be in such, you know, doing such a thing in an area that would bound to attract attention? Uh, but that's a really interesting one. It really, it leaves the role open to possibility. Could it just be a few people that are just twisted doing these things, torturing animals, uh, you know, to get some sort of pleasure out of it? Could they be doing some sort of sacrifice? Could it be people screwing around? Uh, what is it exactly? Lots of questions, no real answers, but it could certainly let the mind wander. Thank you for writing in there. Creepy and very descriptive as well. Zach, in Florida, checks in next. I wanted to share a paranormal experience I had as a young child. I was around the age of six to eight years old, 
and remember vividly having recurring nightmare dreams every night. The paranormal part, to me, of these dreams is I believed there was a demon controlling the dreams. Every night after I fell asleep, I would see a tall orange gecko named Dreamer. I know it sounds crazy, but I would see this character every night in my dreams. Dreamer would then present a large panel of TV screens with different nightmares I would be forced to enter. Basically, there would be a TV of a graveyard, a haunted house, spooky forest, various scary settings. However, there are also some selections I could pick of other frightening events, which would include kidnapping, watching my parents being murdered, etc. Every night, I would have to pick one of these TVs, and I would enter that world and be scared, and eventually it would pass and I'd be back to sleeping. This finally ended after a year or so under the strangest circumstances. I was at a family gathering out of state, and once again I had Dreamer make me pick a dream, and somehow I was able to resist it, and forced Dreamer into a jail cell, and I did not see any more nightmare dreams after that, and I have never once seen Dreamer in my dreams after that. I've never had a ghost sighting or anything physical, but I just feel like that damned orange gecko was a demon that haunted me in my dreams from Zach in Florida. Thank you, Zach. Certainly an interesting one right there. Uh, it, it's interesting to me the duration of this event, uh, that you had these dreams practically consistently for an entire year. If this happened, I, I, re I, I really feel for you that you were, I mean, to have to be subject to this for so long. That is, that is no fun at all, and I imagine that is an understatement right there to say such a thing. Thank you for checking in, Zach. Next we hear from Ronnie. She writes, I hope you're doing well. Sorry to hear about your dental surgery, but I'm glad you are postponing the show to take some time to rest. To interject, thank you for your kind words. I, I'm glad I was able to reschedule the show, too. I know some people were frustrated and disappointed, but... Personally, for the sake of this show, I think it's the best thing that I could have possibly done. Uh, you have a short experience that you just wanted to share. I was working on a drawing in my notebook and set it on the coffee table with my colored pencils once I was done drawing for the day. The next morning, I couldn't find my notebook anywhere. I did two thorough searches, and it showed up about a week later under the edge of the couch where I had already looked. Do you think that this was a poltergeist from Ronnie? Thank you, Ronnie, for checking in. Uh, you know, now the thing is with poltergeists and that uh, phenomena, so here is my understanding of it. It would depend, I suppose, largely on the frequency of such encounters. I hate to be such a killjoy, but there is a, a really good chance that somehow it just got misplaced. Maybe it was the wind. I, I really don't know. Uh, and maybe it just didn't turn up in the searches for one reason or another. But I know that one characteristic, at least in some of the traditional poltergeist experiences, not only are sounds and, uh, you know, all of this sort of stuff, but objects being misplaced and then turning up in very strange locations. Uh, granted, you know, this might be an example of it, where you, you searched twice for the book, couldn't find it anywhere, and then it pops up a week later in an area that you'd already searched. And you're thinking, how the heck did this thing get here? You know, didn't I already look for it here? So what, what was it? I would say it depends. Do things like this happen, uh, you know, more frequently in conjunction with other instances? You know, maybe there's some credibility to that. Otherwise, I would say there is a chance that somehow it was just misplaced. How it wound up there, I don't know. But it just did. I remember once, for me, I don't know, some, some things, all I could really say is some objects just do certain things for reasons I really don't know why, they, they just do what they do. I remember I had this light bulb, it was a stupid place of me to put it, mind you, but I had done this before and I had never ran into problems because I had 
it was in a bathroom, and, you know, there's the bathroom counter right there at the sink, you know, where you can put, as every bathroom pretty much has, you can put combs, you can put your toothpaste, uh, brush, whatever, on the counter. On the wall outlet, there was a nightlight, and I had a spare bulb that was on this counter pretty far in. Now, admittedly, I think it was a pretty stupid thing of me to have this light bulb on this counter here, because granted, it could theoretically slide off or whatever, but I had been doing that for years, and I'd never had an issue. Uh, the light bulb, I'd always... I, I had just put a spare bulb nearby in case, you know, the bulb for this light uh, night light burned out. I could easily just have a replacement. And I don't know why I just didn't put it in a drawer, but it's just one of those weird things that I did. I don't know. It's just... You know, I did it because I did it. I, I, I don't know why. But I'd never had issues. I wasn't all that concerned with the bulb sliding off because I'd never done that before. Uh, one night, all of a sudden, I wake up, I hear this you know, sound, and it's, I go into the bathroom, that's where it emanated from, and I find that light bulb on the floor. I didn't understand why it was there, that had never happened before, and this was really on no sort of incline, because again, if it was, if you put something there and it starts rolling off, it would be stupid to just put stuff there again. Uh, but because I, I had confidently never had that happen, there is no need. But the light bulb wasn't broken, so I thought, that's oh, weird, maybe it rolled off or something, but it's weird that it never happened for years. So I put it back on further, further in a bit, away from the edge. And about five minutes later, I hear this smash and breaking glass from the bathroom. I go in, the light bulb is on the floor again and just shattered at this point. Now, I was freaked out, and in my own mind, I was thinking, what, what, you know, could this be something paranormal? Could it not be? I don't know. I don't know. It was just strange either way. I was never able to witness it actually move or anything. It's just what I heard and what I saw, but it's not necessarily an experience of my own that I'm going to give high priority one way or another, because a light bulb <laughs> is not a very stable object. It is not. I mean, those things can roll around. They can slide around. Uh, if you just sit one on a counter, you're not guaranteed to have the thing stay put, necessarily. It was just strange to me that I had been doing that for years, and I'd never had a single issue. It had never fallen off. It had never even moved. And this one night, it does it once, and then minutes later, it does it again and shatters. Maybe it was a tribute. Maybe there was some low-level seismic activity. Maybe because it's such an unstable object, that's all that it took to uh, dislodge it. I don't know. I don't know. It was strange either way. But some things, they just happen just because they happen. I really don't know why else. So it's certainly interesting either way. Thank you, though, for uh, sharing the experience. I saw you also had another question. Um about disaster uh, preparedness uh, that I will cover another day, but just know I got that too, and it's a good question, so I haven't forgotten about that one. Thanks for writing in. Next uh, piece of feedback is in audio format, and it comes from Savano in Indiana. Hi, so today I wanted to talk about a cryptid that's from my home state, which is Montana. Um, I have a lot of stories from Montana. It was like an extremely interesting place to live. Uh, there was lots of weird animals and like creatures there. And also I have like a lot of weird true crime stories that are from there. But anyway, I lived in Montana for a majority of my life. Um, I moved to Indiana like when I was about 15, just so I could have more like artistic opportunities. Um, and then I'm going to be moving again here for more psychology opportunities for me. But anyways, all of my um, most interesting stories, if not all of them, happened in Montana, including the stuff that I was going to talk about today. So there's a cryptid said to live in the Flathead Lake, which is the largest lake in Montana. 
It's by the Kootenai and Flathead Reservations. And sightings of it go from way back to the like pre-colonizer period of Montana and go until present day. The cryptid is called the Flathead Lake Monster and is could be easily compared to the Loch Ness Lake Monster. But the first official record of it was in 1889 when a man and his ship of 100 men in the lake claimed to see an unusually large whale-like creature in the water. They had no idea what it could have possibly been and one of the men shot at it causing the whatever it was to like go into hiding. And ever since then, there's been multiple records of it and, like, even more sightings of it. There's even been sightings that claim that there's multiple of them living in the lake, whatever it is. I myself have been to the lake um, a handful or two of times, and I've never myself seen anything, but I do know people, like people in my family, who've claimed to have experiences with it. But every time I've gone to the lake, I never wanted to swim in it. Um, I never wanted to do anything but fish in it. Didn't really even like going on boats too much with it or anything like that. Which I guess you could make up your mind of why that was. Whether I had some in my human nature sense that there was something in the lake that was really there. Or the more... um, reasonable explanation which would probably be just that I had pre-existing knowledge that people had told me about the lake and there being something in it that just permanently gave me weird vibes about it but anyway in many of the sightings the flathead lake monster is said to be anywhere from like 20 to like 50 feet large and it's mostly been described as serpent-like which to me kind of goes against the first sighting, which says whale-like. And when I think whale, I think very wide. And when it's like swimming patterns are described in, um, especially in like one of the most popular sightings that had like been talked about on like news stations and whatever, um, it swims in like an up and down pattern, you know, like it has like the humps coming out of the water and stuff, kind of like how a dolphin swims, which to me, when I had like first been hearing about this and you're first, you know, trying to reason with, well, what could it be? Like, could it be like large snakes? Well, snakes don't swim like that. And also I don't know why there would be so many snakes in the water making it appear that there is one large serpent even if they were very large snakes because while snakes in montana can get quite large you know they're not going to be able to make even like up to 20 feet most likely and snakes of course don't swim up and down they swim side to side so i definitely don't think that it is a snake especially if it's going under the water as well which leaves for me the only possible explanation of what it could be if it isn't uh, some sort of lake cryptid or creature is a very large fish or multiple large fish living in the lake. I believe it was around the 50s there was a huge seven foot long fish caught in the lake and that fish is now up in a museum Uh, in the Flathead area and people have claimed to pick up the Flathead Lake Monster on fish scanners Um, you know like when you go on boats and uh, you can have the scanner things to see uh, if you're fishing where the fish are at but I don't know I'm trying to think if I saw a seven foot fish on my scanner or if I saw one jump out of the water even if it was like lightly out of the water or especially if there was multiple of them like if they were feeding even though sturgeon um which is the fish that was caught they eat um other fish they eat leeches and just whatever they can really find honestly but if it jumped out of the water at all if i saw that personally if i saw some huge like seven foot 
creature just out of the water at all or if I saw under the water like seven feet like that's that's taller than like most people <laughs> like I'm five six and I would be so shocked and like just taken aback I, I can imagine people if they saw some fish like that that was in the water if it was even like six feet if you see that in the water I don't think the average person is gonna see that and think oh that's a fish like no that would be that that would definitely I think cause people to possibly maybe exaggerate what they saw or misinterpret what they saw uh, definitely misinterpret I think but me myself I don't think I'd be able to comprehend seeing that in like a right way if I didn't have the knowledge that I do um, now if I saw it I might see something like that in the water and think oh that's like an extremely large fish but if I didn't know fish could get that big or even maybe if I did know I don't think I would have thought that's a fish but in my opinion whether it's large fish in the water or if it's the flathead lake monster I that's still either way that's horrifying <laughs> that's I really hate hearing like I'm really not afraid of anything but thinking about things in like deep water and like what could be there that just that really rubs me the wrong way because like I believe in like aliens and stuff like I like there has to be something else out there but the way that I can be more certain of there being things out in outer space rather than there being something in the water on the planet that I live on. That's that's a little disturbing in my opinion. But if it, either the Flathead Lake Monster or the Loch Ness Lake Monster or anything similar to that interests anybody, I mean, look into it because that it's weird and it's interesting to think about, which is why I wanted to talk about it. Thank you, Savano, for checking in. And uh, thank you also for all your reception reports that you've sent for the shortwave broadcasts. The Flathead Lake Monster. Now, I've never really been to Montana. I was there for maybe, no exaggeration, 10 minutes back in 2011 because I was in Wyoming visiting uh, Yellowstone Park and I crossed into Montana for, you know, a couple minutes just to say I was, I, I visited the state, right? But I was looking at pictures of Flathead Lake. It's a very, very scenic location. You know, it's interesting, and you raise some decent points. Number one, I think when it comes down to these strange creatures, it all depends on the circumstance. Uh, it depends on how many encounters there were, the locations, etc. I mean, for instance, we were talking about Bigfoot and Sasquatch and those sorts of creatures. I am definitely more impartial. I'm not saying that I'm a definite believer, but I'm definitely more impartial or at least interested in them uh, than most people are. But if there's one thing that I am pretty convinced in, uh, it's that I think if there's the best possibility of, you know, new uh, large creatures to exist on this planet... Uh, I think the best chances would be in the water. One example that I commonly cite is, you know, the giant squid. That that's a real thing. I mean, for so long, people thought the giant squid is mythological, you know, the kraken. But in reality, it is a real creature. It is just extremely rare. And even in this day and age, there's only like a few pictures of giant squid that are alive. Now you have some dead ones that wash up every now and then, but to actually photograph uh, them in the wild, it is extremely, extremely rare. People might say, how is that possible? This is a creature that could almost, in some cases, be 50 feet in length. How the heck can it evade cameras like that? Well, the oceans and generally bodies of water <laughs> things can, can sometimes hide themselves very, very well. And it's the oceans are just so massive. So it really makes you think, what is still out there? Maybe nothing is, but I'd say that there is a uh, 
There is a chance, at least. One thing that is interesting to me uh, that you brought up is in terms of what if some of these experiences, and it's a good point, it's something I've thought about, what if some of these experiences with the Flathead Lake Monster are people who have already heard the stories, have already heard, you know, the lore, and have therefore envisioned in their minds the at least prospect of this large, uh, you know, Loch Ness monster type creature living in the lake. So let's say when they're out there, maybe they're swimming or maybe they're on a boat or whatever it is, and they hear a loud splash or they see a shadow, you know, swimming in the water or you know, whatever it is, they see something. Because they have this knowledge, and perhaps this bias as to what they think resides in this lake, uh, some individuals may see that and they're going to think, oh my god, I just saw the Flathead Lake monster. If they had no knowledge of that previously, they might have thought, oh damn, that's a big fish. you know, Or they might not have even thought anything of it. It's just food for thought. But again, I have my own personal bias in terms of the chances of, you know, perhaps undiscovered sea creatures or, uh, you know, just types of fish or whatever they might be still being out there, even on a very large size. So you never know. You, you really don't know. Those sorts of experiences are always just fascinating to me because it really it triggers all the what ifs, you know? What if this is it? You know, it's just leads to so many interesting questions and thoughts, and it's just fascinating. But you also mentioned uh, that they might have had a very large uh, sturgeon there. And I know that uh, sturgeon, those can get really, really big. I remember reading in the news a while back, and I, here's the um, here's the story. Uh, in the Hudson River in New York, unfortunately, sturgeon aren't as common as they once were, uh, you know, due to the development and everything. Uh, I know back, you know, many, many centuries ago, you know, in the days of Henry Hudson and the early explorers, uh, they reported huge sturgeon, you know, in the Hudson River there. But even recently, as of uh, 2019, there was a 14-foot-long Atlantic sturgeon that was discovered in the Hudson River. 800 pounds, it was. 14 feet long. That's crazy. You know, now granted, a 14-foot-long fish, I would be willing to bet, under certain circumstances, someone sees a fish that big, they're going to assume that's not your regular fish. Uh, So, like you mentioned in terms of sturgeon, obviously it's rare for them to get that big, but uh, what if some of those incidents are just people seeing a very large sturgeon because of the legend they think it's something else? Um, But obviously they do have the potential to get very big, and that could uh, definitely lead to some confusion there. But very interesting either way. Thank you for uh, taking the time to record that. You're listening in to VORW Radio International. Feedback on the show is welcome at VORWINFO at gmail.com. Hans is writing in next from Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. First time writer, but has been uh, listening since 2015. This is not really a supernatural or cryptic type of story, but rather a story of something that I truly did not think happened outside of horror movies. My girlfriend and I went out around 8.30 p.m. a couple weeks ago in the goal of having a nice bonfire while the weather still permits. We ventured down to a local park no more than half a mile away. The walk down, we're discussing horror movies, or rather my love for the genre and her hatred of them. It's entirely pitch black night with no light to illuminate the world other than our cell phones. We're no strangers to having bonfires here, and while this particular area isn't really the best spot to have them, we've done it a few times up to this point, as it's really the only place in our immediate area that has enough outdoor space to do so. To describe the area a little further, there's a tiny stream with a buffer of sand around the stream, 
which is a dog park in daylight. We have to walk down a hill, cross through a parking lot, and cross a bridge to get to this area. While on the horror movie subject, I'm purposefully playing with my girlfriend to scare her by making scary sounds and movements. Anyway, we get down to the parking lot and cross the tiny bridge to get to the other side of the stream. We pass the dog park sign, and I have to do a double take because I think I see a mannequin behind the sign. I turn my light over to it, and there's a person standing completely silently and still with his hands down to the side and head straight forward. My girlfriend, already terrified from our discussion earlier, screams and falls straight down to the ground. I'm startled as well and jump back. The person remains completely still and doesn't say a word. You freaked us out. We were just talking about horror movies, I say, but the person just grunts and remains still. My girlfriend recovers and we walk a little further down the park, and when we're far enough away, we settle down and discuss the weirdness of the scenario. At this point, we both agree not to have the fire anymore and turn around. The person isn't there anymore. So we walk back to our apartment, paranoid the whole time that this person is watching us. When we get back, we're trying to think of reasons why this person would be waiting there in that manner. He was likely spooked by the approaching people with flashlights and decided to hide rather than let people know he was loitering. I have a suspicion that he was waiting to jump someone that walked by, but it's such an obscure area, I'm not sure. Perhaps he was waiting for another friend when he saw there were two people, he decided to hide. Either way, the experience was enough to keep me from going into the woods since. Do you have any experiences similar to this? I'm a huge fan of the show. I'm looking forward to tuning in from Hans. Thank you for writing in. And it's certainly an interesting one. Uh, while me personally, I can't say I've had any experience with that, uh, giving your, your experience some thought, I mean, there are a number of explanations possibly. It could be someone just behaving very strangely. It could be someone tripping out, you know, they could have, who knows, maybe they took some psychedelic, uh, psychoactive substance and, uh, you know, are in their own world. That's a possibility too, could explain the behavior. Or like you said, those other, it could be someone who's just afraid of you as you were of him. And he didn't really know how to react, and that just made the situation kind of more awkward. Um, but it's very, very strange either way. I mean, I bet when you guys got there, you were looking for a nice evening, and that's probably the last thing you were expecting to see. So thank you for sharing uh, your experience there. The next experience coming up is from Eric. Hello, John. This is Eric from Winter Park checking in, wishing you and your listeners a very happy Halloween. I'm uh, very excited for this year's show. I just re-listened to last year's, and uh, I'm just so excited. First of all, I wanted to thank you very much for doing this again, hosting this special episode, and I wanted to thank your listeners for all the great stories I know they're going to have. And unfortunately, I don't have any paranormal stories of my own. Um, I, I am admittedly a skeptic, but I'm open to it. I'd love to experience something paranormal to change my mind. Just be a much more interesting world if I believed. And while I may not have any stories, there is one thing that I did want to say. All Hallow's Eve is upon us. The moon is full. The sacrifices have been made. And tonight the devil will walk amongst us. And if you find yourself alone tonight, in a moment of silence... You may hear him whisper to you. We've been trying to reach you regarding your vehicle's extended warranty. Thank you, Eric. Always good to hear from you. I know you've been a frequent uh, contributor to the broadcast in the past, and it's always a pleasure to hear from you. Yeah, I, I think the broadcast, it's been going great so far. It's really, I, I think it's fantastic. So many good stories, so many good experiences, and uh, just a lot of fun all around. Huge thank you to everyone out there who's uh, been participating so far. Uh, it's an awful lot of fun. It really is. Uh, thank you, Eric, for uh, for your part in this broadcast. All right. Well, I'm beginning to feel, you know, in my jaw, this weird feeling that I think I'm starting to end how long I can really talk for. But I will say this. Um, I'm really glad I'm able to go on this long because, my gosh, just... 
I think three days ago, I couldn't talk for more than five minutes. And here we are for, you know, what is it now, the better part of like an hour and a half? Able to do this, so it's wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, any last minute comments are welcome at vorwinfo at gmail.com. Once again, that's vorwinfo at gmail.com. Until next time, wherever you are, be safe, be healthy, and I wish you all the very best. Take care, everyone. This is VORW Radio International.